Well, it's great to be here with you today. And uh, today we are starting a new series of messages that uh, we're excited about. Uh, and the title of our series is Fear Not, and today I want to share a message with, with you entitled The Fear of Insignificance, and I want to start out with a story, and, and I, I try to incorporate stories as illustrations, and I know that in the past I've, I've one time told a story that uh, did not actually happen, and that really caught you off guard, and just to prepare you, the story that I'm going to tell you today is not a story like that. This is a story that, that actually happened, and, uh, and, and some of you may even recognize some of the details. But it was a Friday night. We had some friends over for a bonfire, and a couple of our kids were setting up the tent in the backyard when the phone rang. There had been an accident, and it wasn't just an accident, but there was a youth group party that night, kids from this church that had gathered together. When we got the call, the details were very sketchy. You need to come. You need to come immediately. There's been an accident, and people are hurt. The friends that were over, we each had a child that was at that party. And so as we quickly sped out of the driveway of our home, neither one of us knew if our children were in that accident. When we pulled up to the scene on M28, we couldn't pull right up to the home where the youth group party had been because the traffic was stopped, so we parked along the side of the highway, and I can't say that we walked the rest of it, we ran it. And as we came to the scene, the emergency vehicles were parked in the center of the highway. I remember wreckage being strewn about the highway. I remember the emergency workers as they hurried to get people out of vehicles as they tried to assess what was happening in each of their lives. Within moments, I realized that a precious family had lost loved ones. One family had lost a husband and a father the other family, a precious 16-year-old daughter that was friends with all the kids of our church and part of our church family. The family came as quickly as they could. They stood alongside the edge of the highway. And I'll never forget being a few feet away from them and seeing them huddled there along the highway as they wondered why the rescue workers were not able to remove their daughter from the vehicle. We convinced the family that they needed to go on ahead to the hospital and wait there. And then late that night, as I grabbed the mother and held her by the arm, we walked through the door of that hospital room knowing that on the other side of that door lie her lifeless 16-year-old daughter. That night, we were witnesses to that which is every parent's greatest fear. Many lives were altered that night. They would never be the same again in some degree. Fear is real. The series that we're going to do acknowledges that fear impacts our lives. Fear is real. There's no sense in denying it, the reality of fear. No sense. We know that it exists, it's real. But fear can be logical 
or it can be illogical. Fear can be rational, or fear can be irrational. Let me illustrate my point. I'm going to show you a picture, and uh, I want to ask you if you are afraid of this. Would fear of this object be rational or, or irrational, okay? All right, so let's show the first image that I'd like to show you. Fear of that rational or irrational? Irra- it would be irrational, okay? No, that even looks like a chocolate lab, which we have had, and that's a, that, that's, you just get all mushy when you see that, right? Okay? But those things grow up, and, and so let me ask you this. Uh, this next picture, would the fear of this be rational or irrational? Okay, same, same species, you know, uh, just a little bit different, but rational or irrational? That'd be very rational, wouldn't it? Now, as I was thinking about this, I, I wanted to come up with a few other things, and, um, and I, in my notes, I, I said, I, I wrote myself a note, and I said, picture of a, and then I began to search for a picture of what I wanted to show you, and they were all so bad, I can't, I can't even show you a picture of this, but I, I, I was going to put a picture of a zombie up there, Okay. Now, I'm, you know what? I don't know how much sci-fi you watch, but, but there's no such thing as a zombie. It's not even real, and yet I couldn't bring myself to show it to you because the, just the, all the pictures are so offensive, you know, to, to show it in a, in a church service it just didn't feel right. But, but, but realistic or unrealistic, a fear of zombies. So, <laughs> you're a little divided, I'm just saying, okay? All right, I thought I was going to get an unrealistic, and it's kind of unreal, unreal. And then a lot of you are like, oh, I'm going to hold out on that one. I'm not really sure, okay? I, listen, you know, I, even if, if it, there are cities that are they're creating, you know, these zombie, you know, uh, uh, if, if a zombie attack happens, here's what we're going to do. You know, it's a preparedness plan. I, I, I still don't get that, okay? Um, but, but there are, we, we know, okay, part of us knows it's unrealistic to be afraid of zombies. Okay, here's my final pick. How about this? Huh? Realistic or unrealistic? Huh? Totally realistic, Pastor. <laughs> totally realistic. Uh, and, and I know that some of you, take it down, quick, take it down, because some, some of them are already panicking. You say, Pastor Kevin, that's really unfair that, that, you, would, that you would do that. When we were kids, uh, our folks let us stay up one night and watch uh, a movie. And uh, they did not stay up with us, okay? And the movie uh, was a movie that um, was, it's, it's a very pop, it's a classic, okay? If your kids don't know about this movie, you're just withholding the classics from your children. But it's a movie called Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. You remember that movie? Okay? And, and Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, we stayed up alone to watch that, but that night, and we had bunk beds. My brother Dan and I had bunk beds. And um, we both stayed on the top bunk that night, okay? And the hall light, I remember, was on because I couldn't close my eyes. I, I stared at the open door with the hall light coming in because I knew at any moment this guy was going to come through the door, okay? I knew that the child catcher was coming through the door any moment to get me, and there was no amount of candy uh, that, that could help with, with that. I, I was in big trouble. Realistic or unrealistic? Unrealistic. You know, you say that really loud, but yet zombies, you're divided. I, I, I don't understand. Max Lucado in his book, Fearless, says this. It, meaning fear, will always knock on the door. That was what I was worried about. He was going to knock on my door. It will always knock on the door. Just don't invite it in for dinner, and for heaven's sake, don't offer it a bed for the night. Just because fear exists doesn't mean that we have to allow it to dominate our lives. Now, let me tell you something that's very interesting about Scripture. 
Scripture gives many times in the Gospels, Jesus speaks in imperatives. And an imperative is a command. And it's done based on the authority of the one who is making the command. So if Jesus makes a command, he's, he's basing it on his own authority, okay? And throughout the Gospels, we read 125 different instances where Jesus spoke in an imperative, okay? 125 times, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, I think it's really interesting that if you take those and you divide those up by subject, the second most common imperative or command that Jesus gave was to love God and love your neighbor. The second most out of 125 occurrences, eight of them were that one. You need to love the Lord. You need to love God. You need to love your neighbor. That command given together eight times throughout the gospels. The number one imperative most common throughout the Gospels in Jesus' conversation given 21 times is the imperative to fear not, don't be afraid, take heart, or be of good cheer. Now, I want you to think about that. Almost three times more common than the imperative to love God. Why would Jesus have stressed this so much? Why would he have said it and repeated it so many other times other, over uh, loving God? I'll tell you why. Because Jesus knows us. Because he lived life. He experienced what we experience. Fear is an emotion that we feel about a threat that we perceive whether that threat is real or imaginary. And the question for you and I today is this, how can we gain control of that feeling in our lives? How can we displace that emotion? Well, I think what has to happen is that our minds must be convinced that there is a power that we can access that will literally be able to offset that threat in our lives. A greater power, a greater force than the threat that we are perceiving as coming against us. Jesus said in John chapter 16 and verse 33, I told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have what? Trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus promises us, I guess really he assures us, he doesn't promise us, he assures us that we will have trouble in this world. Thanks, Jesus. We appreciate that. Like, I think we, we by this point in our lives, we have figured out that there is trouble. We will have trouble in this world. He indicates even further that this trouble that we face in the world is actually the source of our fears. If we didn't have any trouble, we wouldn't need to have any fear. So there's a connection between the trouble that we face being the source of our fears. And Jesus, on the other hand, offers us his peace which is based on the fact, okay, it's not irrational, it's not illogical, it is based on the fact that he has done what? He has overcome the world. So this peace that he gives us is not pie in the sky, okay? It's not a crutch. It is based on the fact that he has overcome the world. About his peace, Jesus said in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Fear is real, but Jesus' peace is also real. He says, do not be afraid. We fear many things, and today I'd like to talk to you about that fear of insignificance. Let me ask it in the form of a question, does God care? 
Matthew chapter 8 starts with verse 23. It says that then he got out of the boat, or got into the boat rather, and his disciples followed him. Suddenly, a furious storm came up on the lake. We're talking about the Sea of Galilee here. So that the waves, get this, swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, You of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, What kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. The Greek word there for the phrase furious storm is a word that is only used two other times in the entire New Testament. And that Greek word is the word that is used for the earthquake that happened on Good Friday when Jesus died. It says that there was an earthquake, that the earth shook. The other use happens to be on Easter Sunday morning, the morning of Jesus' resurrection. When the angel came and rolled the stone back, there was an earthquake. And the word is the word seismos. And it's where we get our word for seismograph or seismology. And it's, it's a shaking that took place. And you don't think about an earthquake taking place on the ocean or on a big body of water, but that's what, uh, that's what the gospels are recording here in Matthew chapter 8. And he uses this particular word very specifically. In Gill's exposi exposition of the Bible, he writes regarding Matthew 8.24, he calls the storm a great concussion or a shaking of the sea. Matthew and Luke use a term which signifies a particular kind of wind which is suddenly whirled about upwards and downwards or rather a conflict of many winds. It seems to be a whirlwind or a hurricane. Does that give you a picture of the storm that Jesus and his disciples were in there on the lake? And yet, Jesus was sleeping. Of that entire description, the word that really gets me the most is that the waters swept over the boat, okay? Now, now I, I have a boat, okay? And I like to work on my boat. And I like to take my boat, not out just out on lakes. I also like to take it out actually on Lake Superior. And one of the, 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 the pieces of equipment that I put in there is a pump that will pump water from out of my boat back into the lake. Okay, so if, I've, if I'm taking on any water at all, listen, the, this was so bad that the water was sweeping over the boat. They didn't have that little pump and a battery to do that. Maybe they had something that they were trying to bail water, but this was a dire situation. This was not good. They were literally in fear of capsizing. Can you imagine the disciples talking together probably very loudly because of the volume of the storm? Jesus is sleeping in the front of the boat and they said, hey, you think we ought to wake him up? Should we wake him up? Should we say something to Jesus? I want to draw your attention to a couple things from that story in Matthew chapter 8. They did not wake him up and ask him, can you still the storm? They didn't want to know about his ability. That's not what they asked him. They didn't wake him up and said, Jesus, do you have the power and the ability to stop this storm or at least to, to save us? They were scared literally that they were going to die. They have seen him more than likely already doing a series of miracles. They've been following him for a while. They've seen him do things like feed the 5,000. They've seen him do things like turn the water into wine. They've probably seen him begin to heal people. They didn't ask him if he was able to do it. They also didn't ask if he was aware of the storm. They didn't ask him what he knew. Now, if I were sleeping and there was a storm going on around me, probably I'm not aware of that storm going on around me. 
Sometimes my wife will say in the morning, man, did it rain like crazy last night? And I say, I have no idea what you're talking about. Why? Because I slept through it. I was unaware. But they didn't ask Jesus, are you aware of what's going on? They didn't ask him if he knew anything about the storm. What they asked him was, does he care? They woke him up because they wanted to know, do you care that we're literally going to die? Gill reports in his exposition of these verses that I read earlier that there was a reason that Jesus fell asleep. He fell asleep to give them proof. They seem to seem to feel that Jesus has been limited by weakness, limited by tiredness, liter- uh, limited by consciousness. So they ask, they wake him up and they ask him, do you care? What they really want to know is about Jesus' character. Jesus, do you really care whether we're going to die or not? Notice that when Jesus wakes up, he doesn't apologize for being asleep during the seismos. It was his intent all along. It was very intentional. Look at verse 26 again in Matthew 8. He replied, O you you of little faith, why are you so afraid? There's a connection between the presence of fear in our lives and the absence of faith. The absence of faith always gives way to the presence of fear. That storm was not by chance or by the power of Satan. It was God's plan. And I want you to know today that the storms that you are in in your life, the great shaking, the earthquake, the hurricane that you are in is not there by accident. It is part of God's plan. The seismos is is roaring around you and you're looking at Jesus who's sleeping in the boat that you're in and you want to wake him up and say, do you even care? Now see, we've seen him do the miracles. We've seen that. Even in our own lives. We can look at our own lives and say, I know that he can do miracles. He's done them before in my life. We can say, I, I, I believe that he is so great and so all-knowing. He already knows about the storm. But what I really want to know and what really, really causes me potentially to fear is that question, does he care? Friends, I want you to understand that he cares for you. He's in your boat while the storm is raging. He may appear to you to be asleep, but I want you to know that he cares. Let me mention one other question that you may have. Do I matter to God? Luke chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered, so don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Now, there's, there's another story in Scripture that's told uh, in Matthew chapter 10 that gives a different market value for the sparrows. In Luke, it's two sparrows are sold for a penny. And in Matthew, the story that, that Jesus tells there, it's five sparrows are sold for two pennies, okay? And there's a difference in the market value in the, with, with both of those equations that I want to point out. Now, a, a copper coin, a penny is the smallest uh, denomination, and, and, and you couldn't get any smaller than that. So you had to raise the level or increase the amount of sparrows to equal one penny. You got it? Okay? And the market was set that it was two sparrows, Two sparrows, that's how many sparrows you had to get to equal a penny. But in Matthew's story, Jesus said five sparrows for two pennies. The difference between those two equations is the fifth sparrow. What is the value of the fifth sparrow? Zero. There is no monetary value for the fifth sparrow. The first two, they each have a value. 
they're worth a half a cent each, but you can't, you can't get a half a cent, so you got to raise the, the amount of sparrows to get just one cent. But that fifth sparrow, he's thrown in for incentive. He's thrown in to sweeten the deal because that guy wants to get rid of some, in, some inventory, okay? He wants to get rid of some inventory, and Jesus' point is this. Don't be afraid because you are worth more, not than one sparrow, than many sparrows. Now, many sparrows could be hard to keep track of, but God doesn't even forget about one. Look at verse 29 in Matthew chapter 10. Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And if God has the ability and the power to care for the sparrows to the point that not even one of them falls to the ground outside of his care, and he keeps track of the count of the hairs on your head, which change daily. Okay, don't... Don't laugh at me. Some of you ladies lose every, as much as I have on my whole head. You lose that on a daily basis, okay? Just look at the, your brush at home, okay? Which I don't own a brush, so we can't look at mine. God certainly wants you to know that you matter to him. In Psalm 139, it says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully, ma wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them? Were I to count them, they would, out, uh, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Friends, we are fearfully and wonderfully made by God, knit together, woven by his hands. He even took time to write in his book things from all the days of your life before you lived one of them. Those of us that are procrastinators, we can't imagine that. His thoughts of you are precious, which means weighty. They are so numerous that they outnumber the grains of sand on the seashore. Let me end with Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Friend, I want you to know that you are valuable to him. You are his handiwork. His thoughts of you are precious. Lucado in his book, Fearless, he says, fear of insignificance creates the results it dreads. It arrives at the destination it tries to avoid. It facilitates the scenario it disdains. Friends, fear will take us the opposite direction that we want to go. But God's peace, on the other hand, will take us where we want to go. The voice of fear becomes in us a self-fulfilling prophecy that plays like a skipping record. Fear, it breaks down our confidence in God's goodness. It unleashes doubt in us. It releases the tyrant inside. It deadens our recall concerning all the wonderful things that God has done. Paul writes to his son in the Lord, Timothy, in 2 Timothy 1, 7, where he says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. That word fear literally means weak in the knees. To be so afraid that the strength has gone out of you. Now, I know that there are folks here today, you may be facing great great storms upon the sea of life 
But I want you to know today that he cares for you and you matter to him. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior today as a result of this message, I would encourage you to contact us here at Silver Creek Church by simply emailing me at kevin at silvercreekchurch.org. I'd love to be able to pray with you, and I'd also love to send you what's called Walk by Faith. It's a simple week-long devotional that we've prepared in order to help you as you begin this journey of faith in Jesus Christ. I pray God's blessing upon you today. Thank you.